This is She's on Call, a weekly show hosted by ENT specialist Dr. Sajana Chandra Shaker and general surgeon Dr. Marina Kurian. They'll be joined by guest experts to discuss an array of newsworthy medical and health issues. You're invited to ask the doctors anything. The physicians and their guests' views are their own and do not represent any institution. Please contact your doctor for any personal questions. Please hit share and join us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at She's On Call. Hashtag She's On Call. Please welcome our hosts. Good morning. I'm Sojana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. And I'm Marina Curry, and I'm a general surgeon and a minimally invasive surgeon in New York City. Welcome to our 14th show, Marina. Can you believe it? I wanted it to be the 13th on the 13th, but, <laughs> I really did, but it's not happening. It's our 14th show, which is okay. It might have been too much 13. If you're <laughs> lucky 13. My sister's birthday is the 13th, so we've decided it's lucky in our house. It is. And actually, in, in Sanskrit, 13 is a very lucky number. So if you guys here to four, we're like, oh, my God, 13, bad. No, no, it's only in the movies. It's actually a great day <laughs> and a great number. Well, we have another jam-packed show ahead of us today, Marina. We have two wonderful guests, uh, and maybe you'd like to introduce them for us. Absolutely. So we're going to do a show on cardiopulmonary health or heart and lung health. And joining us tonight today will be Dr. Ron D'Agostino, who's a cardiologist in Long Island in private practice, and he's affiliated with uh, Northwell and NYU. And then also Dr. Jonathan Raskin is going to join us. He's a pulmonologist in New York City. They're both in private practice. And Dr. Raskin is affiliated with Mount Sinai and Lenox Hill. And uh, we're going to talk to both of them about overall health and during the COVID crisis, what they saw. But in addition, we're going to, Dr. Raskin actually got COVID, so we're going to get the doctor as patient perspective and really kind of delve into some of the perspectives he's had um, from having the disease. And so that's, that's it. It's going to be a fantastic show. We are as always live on all the social media channels and uh, please take the moment to uh, like and share and tag any of your friends who might be interested in hearing from these experts on how to improve their own cardiac and pulmonary or heart and lung health. But first, as always, let's talk a really brief bit about uh, the news of the week. Absolutely. So Suju actually brought up our time cover. And the time cover for this week, uh, which is right here, is that we in the U.S. are reaching 200,000 deaths. Um, right now, it's around 194, 194,000. But, you know, in the U.S. as a whole, we're seeing about 3,000 deaths a day. So it should be this this week, unfortunately, that we hit this somber milestone. You know, we talk about the number and it's kind of easy to say the word 200,000. But if you think about it, that number represents 200,000 individual lives lost, individual families devastated, individual communities devastated by this terrible disease. So it is a really sombering, sombering milestone uh, for our country. Uh, certainly the world um, has seen so many deaths uh, and loss of quality of life from COVID-19. So this is still an ongoing health crisis that I think these numbers don't really reflect the, the, uh, the hurt and the loss that we um, are all feeling. Or the, the num these them. numbers also don't rep only represent deaths from COVID, Marina. They don't represent the additional number of people who either could not or did not seek health care during the pandemic for other things and may have had uh, health problems or, in fact, loss of life from that. I know. I think the numbers will change over time. And um, I think the important thing to focus on is what we can do. And, um, you know, New York, I, I always joke with my friends 
Governor Cuomo just emailed me and they're like, oh my God, he did. I'm like, yeah, he emailed me every day. <laughs> a mass email. Okay. But I just like to freak with my friends a little bit. Play, just play. I'm like, you know, so the governor emailed me and he told me. So in New York, we were at like three to five deaths a day. And the overall um, uh, positive rate when we've been testing in so far, um, New York state has tested over 9 million people and um, the positivity rate is just under 1%, which is great news. Uh, I want to bring up, and actually Suju got this too, that C Canada had uh, zero deaths for the first time since March 15th, right? And that um, yeah, which is amazing, right? Yeah. So Canada reported absolutely zero deaths for the first time since March 15th, their population is about 38 million, but they have a nationwide mask mandate, just as do many other countries. For example, Germany, I, I'm simultaneously attending my national otolaryngology meeting uh, on Zoom. I know I'm very amazing like that. But <laughs> <laughs> we have, um, we had a guest professor from Germany talk to us about their national mask mandate. And what they feel that that's done is that has um, staved off any second wave. So every building has a mandatory mask mandate. If you're out in the street and nobody's there, you don't have to be wearing your mask. But if people are around, you have to wear your mask. And I think, you know, those are those three W's, Marina, that we talk about practically every show, right? You wear your mask, wash your hands. Your hands. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be normal. Um, this is a new like, normal, though. Come on, it's a new normal. It's but a new normal. normal. Like now, I feel like the rate is so low that sometimes when I come in from walking the dogs or coming home from work, I'm like, take off my mask, and then I'm thinking, oh no, go in the bathroom, wash your hands. Got to wash yeah. your hands. So yeah. I, I, I still do, even if it's like a quick jaunt outside, because you, you touch certain things like the elevator. You're in New York City, you touch the elevator. You guys, when you live in your own homes, it's probably a different situation, you know? Um, but I definitely think that this this is of concern. Second wave is a concern. There are plenty, there are some countries that did not do a mask mandate, like Sweden. And, um, I, you know, it, but I do think that if you're around a lot of people or if you're feeling ill, that you should be wearing a mask. Um, vaccines were something that I thought for sure that we would have a vaccine by, I really thought, October. So, you are very, very Pollyanna. I like that about you. I love yeah, that. About you. Yeah, I, I'm a very positive person, optimistic. And in, in Italian, it's ottimista, I am. So um, anyway, but... We got some news this week that they that uh, AstraZeneca halted their trial because of one patient having an issue, and they're trying to delve into it to figure out if this is really related or not. And I think you guys got to understand this is like the third round of vaccines already. People have been getting vaccines since I want to say April or May in different phases of a study, and so this is sort of the the fa the largest phase. And they found one patient that had in in a situation, and they're trying to identify whether it is related to the to the vaccine or not. And this is all a normal part, as Suju uh, says, a normal part of any vaccine trial to make sure that, you know, that the due diligence is done in terms of safety and efficacy and to ensure that the vaccine isn't causing a problem. Because you have a disease that you're trying to treat. You don't, with your treatment, want to cause another disease. Yeah, and I think this is an interesting thing. The general public is learning a lot about how physicians and public health professionals think and work that, you know, you guys didn't really know. You just knew that if something got approved by the governing body, that it was safe and effective. So this is not to panic people. This is just to say that the vaccines are actually not being rushed to market, they are being evaluated thoroughly so that when we do get a vaccine that is shown to be effective, it is something that we also consider to be safe. And then there's one more topic, Marina, that I want to talk about. And I know we're very fortunate to have a high level pulmonologist, lung specialist on the show with us today. The Western part of our country is on fire and it's devastating. Um, we have a map to show you all the places that have been affected 
by these wildfires in the western portion of the United States. We know that there was a big fire at the site of the explosion in Beirut uh, a few weeks ago. There was a fire this week. This picture is on the right is the same beach at Crescent City, California, taken by one of our viewers, Elaine Morales, and it shows the exact same beach to, on Monday and then after the wildfires on Tuesday. It's rather surreal. Um, so we're going to be talking about air quality. And, you know, we can't let 9-11 go by without thinking about what happened 19 years ago. And as New Yorkers, what we experienced um both with the loss of life and the fear, uh, devastation when the Twin Towers uh, were brought down by terrorists. But do you remember that huge plume of dust and debris that seemed to linger over the towers or where the towers were for weeks later? You know, I think that was something where that just reminded us every day for weeks and months about uh, how terrible uh, that attack was. And, you know, we all um, remember that day and, uh, you know, hashtag never forget. I don't think we ever will forget. Um, but- well, you know, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, that day we, I was in the city and I was at work and uh, it, 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 Yes, I don't even think there was fear. We're scrappy New Yorkers. We were angry and and the loss, there's loss and and sadness, profound sadness, but it it was not a time of I mean it wasn't a fear necessarily. Uh it was a shock that this could happen to New York and you know interestingly there's so many other countries that there are terrorist activities all the time and bombings of buses and this and that and we have been in this country fairly protected up until that time. Um, but as to the smoke and the air quality, it was, uh, yes, there was a plume. I, I live on the Upper East Side and went down to 14th Street about, um, within a week or so, not to go to the site because what was I going to do there? You know, nothing, but just to go downtown and you could smell something. It was a, it was in the air and it stayed in the air for weeks. Not only that, that plume that you saw of smoke. It went over into Rockaway and, and it, it blew around, just like we see what's happening with all these fires, you know, on the West Coast. I, I spent yesterday and today eating breakfast outside in the country and we have a beautiful blue sky. And I just thought, oh, my God, my colleagues on the West Coast, our, our, our fellow citizens on the West Coast are not allowed that privilege because their air quality is so dreadful, right? And they cannot sit outside and there's actually a, a risk to them. Um, but yeah, there's, we can't let 9-11, unfortunately, which, you know, the, the ceremony was on, uh, on Friday, the 19th uh, anniversary of the towers uh, falling, but um, it, it was a big deal here for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's in this uh, spirit of maybe resilience and recovery um, that we think about COVID. We think about what's happened in 2020. We think about what happened in 2001. We're really fortunate to have uh, two wonderful specialists come on with us today. Um, we have Dr. Ron Diagostino, who is a cardiologist. We have Dr. Jonathan Raskin, who's a pulmonologist. Um, there are so many questions we have and our viewers have for them. Uh, as always, we are live on all the social media channels. Please like and share and tag any friends who might be interested in this conversation. Uh, welcome aboard, Ron and Jonathan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're doing? excited to have you guys on. I want to start with Ron. You know, when we uh, we were during the pandemic, during the quarantine, all of my colleagues, my surgical colleagues were saying, and I'm sure Sujana, yours were saying similar things that I'm like, where are all the appendixes and the gallbladders and the diverticulitis? You know, how come the, we're not seeing any of that come in? And part of it was fear of going to the hospital because they looked at that as a COVID center, you know, but part of it was people are just afraid to go or they minimize their symptoms. And I can only imagine that as a cardiologist, that you saw a significant 
rise perhaps in patients that should have been seen sooner or later, or perhaps I'm wrong. And actually people, I mean, normally with stress, people have heart findings, right? Yes, that's, that's uh, very correct, Marina. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, everything became COVID. Hospital was overwhelmed with COVID and other problems still go on. Patients still have heart attacks and heart failure exacerbations and strokes. And, you know, for perspective, um, there are uh, every 36 seconds a cardiovascular death, and uh, those deaths were not, uh, you know, being treated or prevented, I should say, uh, as much as they should have. Uh, typically, you know, we see a number of calls to the emergency room EMS for two coronary syndromes. Uh, patients coming in within a couple of hours of their two uh, coronary event, cardiac event, being treated promptly, brought to the hospital promptly, and we would definitely were not seeing that. Instead of patients coming in with ST elevation MIs, they were coming in with Q-wave MIs a day or two or more later and, and, and suffering from those complications or even just dying at home. If you look at the, uh, the EMS statistics during the peak of the pandemic in March, April, and May, there was a threefold increase in sudden cardiac death uh, calls, which is a very, very dramatic number. Typically, there are about uh, 15 per 100,000 uh, sudden cardiac death uh, EMS uh, calls. Uh, it was 2019 data, and that jumped to 47 uh, per 100,000 uh, during the pandemic. So there was a market reduction in ACS and a very significant increase in SCD, or sudden cardiac death, different acronym with a, obviously a much uh, worse outcome. So, you, so the so-called uh, collateral damage that we saw. Ron? When yep. you when you say so, the one slide we showed on STEMI, we call it because we're, we're not cool, but that's what we call STEMI. Yes, but it's ST elevation myocardial infarction. And from what I understood from what you said, this is an earlier. Um, it's earlier in the in, in the heart attack than a Q wave, which is you know I, I wish we had that slide of the the heart rate. I mean the heartbeat, right? Like where we could see it electri el el uh, electrically, actually. And, um, but, but this is, a STEMI is an earlier version than the Q wave when you have it and patients show up and it's further along in their heart attack. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. Instead of patients coming in, you know, typically within an hour or two of their uh, chest pain syndrome, their heart attack syndrome, and getting to the emergency room promptly and being treated promptly, we have a door to balloon times, getting patients to the cath lab within an hour, getting the balloon within 90 minutes. We have guideline criteria that, that we meet. So when patients are coming in now, a day or two later, the, the outcomes uh, from those interventions are not nearly uh, as helpful. So I think, you know, for our audience and, and maybe for the ENTs who don't really know much about anything like me, um, when you have an ST elevation heart attack or a STEMI, that's a reversible thing that leaves little or no actual heart damage, right? When you have a Q wave mm -hmm. problem, that heart attack actually leaves long-term damage that's irreversible to the muscle of the heart. Is that is that a good way to, to yep. say that? Yes, yes so you're trying to exactly right. Away. Yeah, right? She's yes. a ringer. Don't believe her when she says she doesn't know. You know, <laughs> and, and ST elevation is an, is an ongoing active uh, infarction uh, where there is the, uh, the the hope that you can reverse uh, that damage by restoring perfusion to that to that artery and to that portion of the heart. So if you get to patients uh, within a reasonable amount of time, you can prevent a lot of damage. So. That 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 was a big part of the so-called collateral damage that we saw patients, and I had patients of my own with acute coronary troubles, uh, patients who we had on cardiac monitors, outpatient monitors, so we could monitor their heart rhythms, and then informing them that they're having a problem with uh, heart block and issues, and, and some of them are even nurses and healthcare professionals saying, I'm not going to the hospital, doc, I don't care. And that, that was a, a big, big problem. Patients not seeking appropriate medical care because of fear of acquiring uh, the COVID infection during their hospitalization or ER visit. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it is a crisis. You know, don't think that 
I would be surprised if none of us had a little chest pain during the quarantine. I certainly did. And I was like, I think it's GERD. I think it's reflux. I'm okay. I'm just gonna, you know, um, and the, you know, well, you know, we have a, we have a question from RTH and that was, was the increased mental stress of the pandemic partly to blame for the, for that spike that you mentioned, John, in cardiac events? Ron, Ron, Ron. Ron. Uh, yes. Ron. I mean, there's no, uh, you know, definitive studies that, that look at, you know, is it stress that's causing the problem or unaddressed problems? You know, many of these patients have underlying diseases, the same kind of comorbidities that increase their risk of uh, COVID complications also put them at risk for heart attacks and strokes, obesity, uh, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, unhealthy lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle. So whether stress uh, or all these other factors, they, 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 it's never one thing. I, I certainly would think that stress, we know that stress causes lots of problems, uh, increases catecholamine releases, elevates heart rate, elevates blood pressure. There are hemodynamic, adverse hemodynamic effects related to stress. Um, so definitely uh, plays a role. Uh, I mean, heart disease doesn't go away. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of patients uh, don't appreciate still you know, we have about 700,000 uh, cardiovascular deaths per year. One out of four deaths uh, in this country are due to heart disease. Again, one patient or one person every 36 seconds. I just think that during the course of this one hour uh, show, how many uh, patients will die of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so important not to lose uh, perspective. Uh, COVID is uh, clearly important. We might hit 400,000 deaths this year. Um, hopefully not. Uh, that would represent about, you know, one out of eight deaths. But don't forget, uh, heart disease is still killing one out of four. So I, I, it would be nice if the media and healthcare professionals didn't lose sight of that. You know, the pandemic will end, uh, COVID will end, but the pandemic of heart disease will not end. So it would be nice if we placed as much importance on a healthy lifestyle, exercise, eating healthy, uh, as we do on face masks. Face masks are important. I have mine, you know, with me. Whenever I, I leave, you know, my, my, my home, I'll go to work. But it's important to get out there, go for a walk, get some sun. If you can, go for a bike ride. Eat healthy most of the time. You know, address your issues. Not to lose sight of that. Well, I want to um, shift gears a little bit. I want to... Uh, we have so many questions for both of you about, you know, long haulers and things like that. But I, I want to get to, Jonathan, you... Um, you know, you're, you're seeing patients during the pandemic. Both of you guys were, we all were actually. And, you know, you had a sudden health scare, which was completely unexpected. I mean, who would, who would think, right? So I just want you to kind of go into what happened to you during um, like sure. March or actually March and, and what's been going on with you. Right. Um, by all means, uh, happy to. But if I might just to digress or, or just continue on one issue you guys brought up, which I think is really important. Um, with all of the stress, the immune system clearly registers it. And I've been seeing a lot of shingles. So this is an unsolicited but important uh, reminder that the shingles vaccines really do work, really mitigate disease, prevent it in a large uh, population Um almost independent of age now, the, the most recent vaccine is that powerful. So um, along with cardiovascular disease, I've seen weight gain and um, blood pressure elevations and all the illnesses attendant to stress. Um, so, but, but shingles is one of them and, and do remember to vaccinate. So my story, um, I really thought the illness was from Wuhan off of a boat, um, a cruise uh, ship, off of California and just beginning in Washington, but little did I know, as most of us, that it was in our backyard. And uh, I was one of the earlier patients, um, early March, uh, end of February, early March. I had a prodromal syndrome, which I thought might be um, influenza or any virus. It was in wintertime. And uh, when I had my first fever early March, I started Tamiflu. Um, hoping it was influenza, but deep down somehow knowing it wasn't. I just, the presentation was a little atypical. And in, in short order, it became clear to me that it was not influenza because there was no response at all to Tamiflu. The fevers, in fact, were escalating. And a little bell went off in my head that I really shouldn't be my own physician. I, my O2 sats were normally 98 and had gone down to 94. 
steady drop on a daily basis. The fevers were unremitting and decided to go to the emergency room, which was actually very fortunate because that night I crashed. Uh, in the ER, they found that I was pretty sick. I actually didn't go to stay. I thought I was just going to get swabbed. And in those days, they had the whole Northwell Health System had 50 swabs for their all of their hospitals. And I was insistent uh, to, on getting one, and they agreed. But um, that was the least of it. I mean, the diagnosis came two days later. I had bilateral pneumonia, and um, I had uh, very few lymphocytes, which are the cells we use to fight viral disease. Um, I had 19% bands in the face of a viral disease, which I had never seen. And I've, uh, I was involved in running an ICU for 20 years, a group of us at uh, a hospital that's now a fancy condominium, and um, Beth Israel North. And so um, it was daunting uh, to be on the other side of the stethoscope. Uh, I knew that um, I needed the ICU, so I was in their care pretty much throughout my stay. I did not get intubated, but the first night that I arrived, I crashed. And my blood pressure went down to 80. My SATs were 80. Um, and I, I had this Kubler-Ross kind of moment where I was not afraid. I was floating. I was at peace, tremendous peace. I sensed all the hubbub around me, but um, could care less. The following morning, uh, I, you know, I came out of it. They, they, they resuscitated me. I don't know if I would have made it had I been home. And, um, and it was sort of welcome to the rest of your life <laughs> because I had 103.7 fever and I was really in pain, um, clenching headaches and muscle pains and pretty bad fevers. And the head of infectious disease shows up, um, who was great. They all were great, actually. They really pulled me through, but was honest and saying, uh, look, we don't know what we're doing. We're reading about what to do in China. Uh, so you're reasonably healthy, have no significant comorbidities. We're going to watch you. And I was a bit like a deer in the headlights saying, okay, uh, not real ha really happy to hear that, but understanding that they really didn't have a beaten path and didn't know what to do. So for the next three days, I had hectic fevers and I was beginning to slip. And um, the head of the ICU comes in and says, we're throwing the kitchen sink at you. And uh, what they meant was they gave, had a cocktail of hydroxychloroquine, Coletra and HIV therapy, both of which have pretty much fallen out of favor. But what really actually saved me was the management of cytokine storm. And so um, I received something called tocilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 inhibitor to the uninitiated. Cytokines are these chemicals that are not stored in the body, but are elaborated when, when there's an event. And you could imagine a modest event like a cut. The cytokines are working in your behalf by sterilizing the area and helping remaining aseptic realities um, locally. But when dysregulated, which was what which is what happens in sepsis or in burns or in mesenteric ischemia or bad pneumonias, you know, these cytokines are really elaborated in a way that make you very, very sick. So the tocilizumab was remarkable in that it turned my temperature curve around immediately. I've taken care of many people in my situation. And I know that when you initiate a therapy, it takes a day or so to get tissue levels and another day or two to see the fever curve begin to change course. My fever curve defervesced within 24 hours. It was stunning. And I knew right then and there that I would make it. I just had the sense that once the fevers were beginning to abate, we all follow fever curves and in, in infectious diseases. And, um, and my fever curve was going out of control. The people were saying things like, you know too much. When I'd say, you know, my fever curve isn't responding. Isn't it time to do something? Oh, you know too much. And I'm looking at them like, I'm not playing stupid here. This is about, you know, surviving. So it was daunting, you know. It was, it was my turn. Um, but there was no pity party. I was at peace. I realized, I knew, I know that I've had a wonderful life. And I wasn't about to, um, you know, get down on my luck or, 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 begin to get infantile and childish. I just realized I had a fight in front of me and uh, engaged everybody in, in trying to give them the best history that I could provide in my own behalf. I mean, it's an so, amazing know. story. Just Yeah. I mean, th this, this points out, like, we are not our best uh, diagnosticians when we get sick. We are really good at um, uh, ignoring evidence that's in front of us. You did talk about pulse oximetry, and I think it's time to reintroduce that to our um, to our viewers. I have a pulse ox on now, mm -hmm. 
And while you were, when you started talking, it was at 99 and it's come down to 96. And I guess I better breathe in deep and get it back up. But I think this is something small that people can have in their homes to look. I think taking their temperatures, you know, my, my daughter is back at school um, uh, right now, virtual while they're fixing the HVAC. But when they go uh, back in reality and when they go to, for example, marching band practice, they have to take their temperature every day. So I think using these two, um, these two points of information, the temperature and the pulse ox, uh, can be very, very helpful. Um, thank you for sharing your story. If I may, if I may it's now actually a vital sign. Mm-hmm. So, uh, along with blood pressure, temperature, pulse, respiratory rate, pain on a scale of one to 10 and O2 sats are mm-hmm. now included in our vital signs. When the epidemic was really in full blown bloom in New York, I was, um, upon discharge taking care of patients and trying to get them O2 sat monitors, but we couldn't find one and they right. were gone. So this is a good time to get an O2 sat monitor along with a blood pressure cuff if you're inclined, if you need to. But yes, it's part of the vital signs and and, and I'm glad you reemphasizing it. I think, um, you know, John, thank you for sharing. I know Sujana's pulse ox went down because she was probably breath holding because I, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, <laughs> but like so dramatic and so scary. And, you know, the team around you, the respect they showed you, and I think that the respect they showed every patient, like I've, I've heard it from different institutions, my colleagues everywhere, to show patients who are suffering and trying to take care of them. And you brought up a few great points, one of which people at, in February to March, we were trying to learn from Wuhan or the Chinese experience. We were trying to learn from the Italian experience. And, you know, I was in a chat group with um, Italian and, and, and other physicians from around the world to try and, and see, even though I'm not in front lines and you are, you as a pulmonologist, you were seeing patients or you would have been, you know, seeing patients that had COVID had you not gotten sick right then as yourself, but afterwards you certainly did. Um, but it, it, to, this is what's one thing that we've both been saying that this has been an incredible, um, Petri dish for us to figure out what, and, and viruses, Guys, I know, I know you guys all know this, but for our listeners, viruses do not grow in petri dishes. But <laughs> it's been what it is. It's like a culture medium where we're trying to figure out what's happening and how we can best address it. It's the research has been incredible, but unfortunately, with that, there's been significant toll on so many people. And while you experienced that, Jonathan, and you've had like a real Zen sort of peaceful. Uh, acceptance and 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 not like why meaning it. I, at the same time, I have to imagine that your family must have had significant just fears and and concern, and it, it can shape all of our perspectives going forward. Yeah, so my I recently visited my sister um, this past weekend, Labor Day weekend, and we talked a great deal about what they went through. It was it was hard because they really suffered. They had didn't have access. Thank God for cell phones. Thank God for Facebook. I mean, I, I kept in touch as best I could for as long as I could to let people know my status because it there's a you know there's a community. We live in a community, and everybody's related. And it was hard for my family, especially. Yeah. So we had a very nice comment from Danielle Mojica, who is a school nurse, and she talks about the fact that she's been using pulse ox for a long time. And I think that's, you know, healthcare providers are comfortable understanding pulse oximetry. When I posted a YouTube video for my community about pulse oximetry early on in the in the course of this, um, I actually hung this same pulse ox from my from um, a railing in front of my house so the community could come by I would clean it in between their uses and they could check their pulse ox and if I had a couple come over who I think were breath holding and anxious and very worried that their pulse ox was going down and they came over and we in fact had an informal medical chit chat about how healthy they in fact were so I think uh, like everything else, the general public is learning more, um, you know, as we said earlier with Ron about how to take care of yourself, whether it be 
from COVID, whether it be how to live healthier for cardiovascular disease, how to breathe healthier for pulmonary disease. It's a very interesting time if we try to take the good uh, from this terrible circumstance. Dr. Molay wrote in and asked, what about ACE inhibitors? So maybe uh, we can talk about different types of medications that are used in cardiology, including ACE inhibitors and what you think about them. And, but I also want um, Ron to a little bit talk also about what we're seeing after with with patients who have had COVID nineteen. You know, we uh, as you know, Jonathan pointed out, we are a community and we have our friends on Facebook. And I happen to be in a couple of groups with doctors and you know, people that doctors and surgeons that have had the disease are like, you know, my heart races randomly. Like I have all these, these, you know, symptoms that I didn't have before. So we want to talk about some of the symptoms that you're seeing, Ron, in terms of heart health, uh, as well as answering Suji's question. Okay. Those are four topics. <laughs> no, I'm going to try no, to remember, no. <laughs> uh, but, but first I, I do want to, uh, Say, John, that's an awesome story, and uh, I'm touched by it. I got some chills listening to it, and uh, my heart goes out to you and your family, and I'm so happy you made that uh, wonderful recovery, and you're here to talk to us today. So, uh, Thank you, Ron. Thank kudos. You. Uh, really uh, heartbreak. Well, I don't want to say heartbreaking. <laughs> Heart-touching. How's that? Thank you. Um, and then uh, to John's uh, comments about pulse oxes, I have one too, but I don't want to leave my seat to show it to you, but. Uh, you know, you learn from crises, and we've learned a lot. We were doing telehealth for months, uh, in March, April, May. We're back to doing, you know, mostly live now. But, you know, having patients uh, have that basic equipment, a blood pressure monitor, a thermometer, uh, a, a pulse oximeter. Unfortunately, a lot of our sicker patients are on uh, cardiac monitoring remotely, the patients with heart failure and arrhythmia, so we could see what their heart was doing remotely. Um, so, so having... All those, uh, all that equipment in the home is very helpful. Actually, we'll take it forward as well uh, for, for patients. You know, let's say in the winter, the snowstorm, they want to get out, and we can do a pretty good assessment through, uh, through telemedicine. That surprised me how well we could evaluate patients. Uh, it's uh, pretty remarkable. So definitely have the equipment. I've even been recommending. Uh, I don't want to advertise for a company. But there are machines out there that not only give a very good blood pressure and do get an upper arm cuff. Don't get those finger and wrist cuffs that are not accurate. You want an upper arm cuff. Um, Omron, uh, I think, makes one of the better uh, models. Uh, they have one that you actually put your fingers on. I got it for my mother, my sister, myself, where you could put your, your finger on the machine. and also get a little EKG strip as well that you can put on your phone, send to your doctor. So having some, some of that stuff in your home can make life easier. And then one other piece of equipment, which is next to me, uh, that I think all patients should have, is like a 10-pound medicine ball, okay? <laughs> so, you know, don't lose track of, even if you can't get out, uh, do a little bit in the home, roll out of bed onto the floor, try to do some push-ups, sit-ups, planks, squats with a medicine ball, whatever you can do. I know many of our patients are limited by orthopedic issues, back pain, spine pain, hip pain, but whatever you can do, um, your physical well-being uh, helps your emotional well-being as well. Um, if, you, if you're able to get a dog, get a dog. They show having a dog reduces your risk of dying from heart disease by 30%. And we'll get to some of the interventions we do. ACE inhibitors came up, so I'll be a little segue. You know, we had an early on uh, concern about patients on uh, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin, coronary enzyme inhibitors, ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, was a theoretical issue because when you're on these meds, there's an upregulation of the ACE2 receptor. And the COVID virus has these uh, spikes. And you know, I've been asked about some mutations by some of my colleagues and friends, and these spikes are mutating a bit and getting a little more aggressive. Uh, and and they, they, can, they penetrate through that ACE2 receptor. So it was a theoretical concern that you're on ACE inhibitors or ARBs and you have an upregulation of the receptors that you could be more vulnerable to a COVID infection and more complications. So it's theoretical. It hasn't been borne out. The studies I've seen looking at serum, uh, not necessarily tissue, but serum ACE receptors, um, you know, markers for that have not shown an increase. It's not been an issue. The, uh, fortunately, the ACC, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, our, our main organizations, Early on, came out with position statements that they maintained 
that if patients are on these therapies for hypertension or, or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, heart failure, they should remain on them not to be stopped. You can still use them. And, and we do use them even in patients uh, who have some, some sequelae from COVID. And we'll talk a little bit about those sequelae. A, a, a significant percentage of patients uh, who get COVID will develop cardiovascular issues related to having had a COVID infection. Uh, we still use those meds when appropriate uh, for pressure and heart failure. Uh, up to 20% to get to the fourth point, you know, this, the, the long-term sequelae of having uh, COVID, uh, do develop some sort of cardiovascular issues. And it's not clear if it's due to COVID itself, if it's due to their underlying comorbidities, which many of these patients have, such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, pre-existing heart disease, but it definitely in those patients, uh, you know, rocks the boat quite a bit, just like flu rocks the boat. I do want to please emphasize to everyone, get a flu vaccine now more than ever. It's so important because we are expecting a uh, busy flu season. Uh, get the vaccine early before, you know, we run out. Uh, and I, I anticipate we probably will, like we did a couple of years ago. So uh, get your flu shot uh, as quickly as you can. Uh, and, and you know, again, uh, take care of yourself. So like no, I said, about 20% yeah, will we'll have uh, complications. The myocarditis, uh, arrhythmias, um, we see a hyperthrombotic state from COVID infection. Uh, so anticoagulant therapy is typically used for a period of time uh, yeah. after COVID. Jonathan, were you on a blood thinner during your hospital stay? Yeah, I was. To their credit, they realized... Uh, there is a hypercoagulability associated with the infection. I was prone put on to clotting. prone to clotting. Is clotting sorry, right? Prone to clotting. I uh, I had three organs involved: the lung, obviously. During my stay, I coughed up sputum that was black, and I in forty years I'd never seen that. Forty one, and it was necrotic lung, uh, so that was daunting. So my lung was really the most afflicted. But I began um, having abnormal liver enzymes, so my liver was involved. And then a kind of funny moment happened. Um, I, unbeknownst to me, I was having um, bigeminy, uh, ventricular arrhythmias and, and bradycardia, slow heart rate. And so one of the residents or interns comes in and says, are you, enters the room and says, are you an athlete? And I'm thinking, what in heaven's name would make him ask such a question? And then he said, well, you're having, your fever is 103 and, and you're having a pulse of 50. <laughs> and I looked at him and sort of like, find the cardiologist, go away. <laughs> but um, I had around a BNP of four, close to 400, which isn't astronomically high, but um, clearly I had some myocarditis because um, my follow-up, my BNP, which is to the uninitiated is the a brain natriuretic peptide. It's a biomarker of cardiac health. It went back down to 22 and I probably need an echo, um, but um, my primary is a cardiologist and didn't think there was any urgency. So the reality is that, um, yes, the daunting part of this, I think, is the uh, that we might be able to get somebody through the viral aspect of it all if, with a little bit of luck. And, and it's not luck. Let me reframe that. People have to understand when they're sick, they need to get attention. So I actually did do the right thing early on by saying I'm not going to be my doctor and, and went to the hospital knowing that I needed help. That's a big deal because there's a little dance that you do with this virus. You have to understand the steps or you're going to fall. And the reality is that treating cytokine storm appropriately early on, uh, treating the virus with whatever is within reach, dealing with um, dexamethasone now, which is the only drug that has actually been proven to change mortality outcomes, really does set the stage for the likelihood of a better outcome. And yet, having been through this with many and I have, um, I know that if you don't get it done correctly, the downstream effects like hypercoagulability can cause heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, and stroke. And I've seen it. COVID toes is essentially microvascular um, um, clotting. And so it really is about knowing what to do in a timely fashion. And I think what is so important is that the role of human behavior, we it to prevent or to address this illness, can't be understated. If you ask the question, how did New York going go from being the worst of it all in the States to the best? 
it's about leadership and bravo to Governor Cuomo and really being honest about what you need to do and doing it. Wear the mask. Socially distance. If you're sick, stay home. Be respectful of others. I call it discovering soap. And one of the things that might happen, and this is speculative, but I I will share that the masks that we're wearing, and here's mine, (laughs) um, are not just about COVID. It clearly is going to impact on other viruses. So there's a chance if people do take on on, the flu shot and do what we've been doing, public health measures, that this won't be a terrible season for influenza or adenovirus or rhinovirus or whichever you know, virus you want to talk about, because these measures, these public health measures really are um, ubiquitous in their, their benefits. And, and it's time to talk about why we're better and how we can do this. It's about human behavior. I think that's beautiful. I think that you are 100% right. I'm so glad that you're following Marina's best friend, Governor Andrew Cuomo, who uh, emails her every day. No. We have, <laughs> we, have, um, we have viewers from all over the world who watch us, and they are really benefiting from both of our guests and their and their uh, wisdom today. Um, we had a lot of questions about what is a pulse oximeter, so and whether the drugstore type is good enough, and the drugstore type is in fact good enough. Um, they, this goes on your finger, you turn it on and it will give you an idea of the oxygenation in your blood. It's not as good as the one in the hospital, but it's very good. Um, if you're getting a low reading, you may be breath holding or anxious, take like three or four deep cleansing breaths and watch that number go up towards 99. Um, so this is non-invasive. It just clips on your finger. Um, and I recommend it. I think all four of us do recommend that you get one at home, uh, as uh, Ron was saying. Uh, we have um, we had a comment about uh, being a good citizen and doing what Jonathan talked about is just be a good citizen. You know, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, stay home if you're sick. I will tell you guys, I did go to the movies this week in an actual movie theater. Wow. Yeah, I know. It was awesome. Jersey. Um, Jersey. I I didn't really quite follow the plot, but that's because I'm apparently very old and uh, incapable. But um, we, it was 25% capacity. It was um, designating seating. It was really clean. We all wore masks uh, because we were far enough apart. When we were eating our popcorn, we could take our masks down. They immediately rushed in to do a thorough cleaning as we left. The uh, concession stand was super clean. The only thing is um, uh, you got to hold it till you get home because the bathrooms, especially for women, neither my daughter nor I trusted. Uh, but I think, you know, re, our, our positivity rate is well below 1%. So reopening society, reallowing us to be human with this uh, new reality is very important. We have a viewer, Anne, uh, Annie Kang from California watching. Uh, she's a dancer. She's an actor. Uh, but she's also living in uh, the area where the clouds, the sky is, in fact, black and sooty. And I'm wondering, Jonathan, if you could talk to us a bit about these air quality problems that our friends in the West are experiencing and what they can do to uh, minimize any permanent damage. And I would add that the West Coast looks like Mars. Just saying. Yes. Yeah. It's daunting. The question and whole issue is daunting. But I don't think we should just think about it in terms of the current travails, which are which are unbelievable, really. It does look like Mars. We are, we are in a new situation, unbeknownst to us, really. But it's naive to say that it's just about this moment. As you guys started early on talking about 9-11, um, it goes back even before then. We were warned decades ago that global warming was real. And you had all of these naysayers, oh, the Earth goes through these patterns, completely denying the human contribution. We're not going to change what the Earth does you know, over the millennia. But we can change our own behaviors. Again, human behavior is really in the crosshairs of our discussion. And so, um, as an example, in 1998, um, the Department of Vital Statistics in the United States noted that lung disease went from number five to number four. 
so, uh, the top five killers. So it was then heart, cancer, stroke, accidents, and then lung disease. And lung disease then became number four in 1998. And the CDC said by the year 2020, lung disease, because of pollution and because of all this is happening, lung disease will be number three. Well, it happened in 2007, 13 years before the CDC anticipated lung disease becoming number three. Um, and so this has been going on for quite a while. Most recently, accidents have actually surpassed lung disease. So now lung disease has been put into number four. Accidents are number three, the most recent data from the government. And that's probably representing an older population and, and falling and things of that nature. But the point is, we have been warned and we do things like walk away from the Paris Accord. We have been warned and yet we deny. We have been warned and yet we make up fake news. So it's really a challenging situation to get your arms around. But I would characterize it a bit in this manner. There's going to be an acute disease related to it. And then there's going to be the concern of chronic disease. Uh, at Mount Sinai, Dr. Selikoff came up upon the fact that asbestos caused cancer and pulmonary fibrosis and other illnesses of the lung. <clears throat> it took 20 years for those asbestos workers to demonstrate the illness. And lo and behold, what happened at the World Trade Center was yet another moment where there was acute disease. And then decade to two later, we're seeing cancer in these same survivors. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask, what can we do? We need to have the government really act responsibly. We need to have industry to really act responsibly. Recycling your plastic, you know, Coke bottle or something like that isn't making it. We do what we can on an individual basis, but we need to step up in a meaningful way as a society and join the rest of the world in saying we are at crisis. We were warned, we ignored it, and now we are living it. The world is on fire, not just California. Wow, Jonathan, that those are those are great points and they're valid points. And I think um, certainly something that we all try to decrease our carbon footprint individually. And you know, it's still a, it's still a hard situation though. We're 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 coming up on the end of our show. Um, we do have some viewer questions, so that so we need to get in. This is from Alana Locker. She says hi from Israel, Ron. Uh, she had a great question about pulmonary embolism, which is basically a clot that goes from somewhere up to the lung. And can it appear much later? Um, and is that, it, you know, like, so sometimes what we're seeing, and both of you certainly can comment, we're seeing people, I met with a doctor who's like, I had COVID. I know I did. He had all the same symptoms that all the common symptoms. And yet he tested twice negative. His antibodies are negative. But when you look at the constellation of symptoms, it's impossible to say that he didn't have it because of what he's experiencing. <clears throat> and then also some of these long hauler symptoms with Jonathan, I can hear you. You had a cough, you, you know, you know, it just there are certain symptoms that patients are still going to experience. And so tying all that in, when you see someone who's been tested negative for COVID-19, like Alana's 93-year-old family member, but then has a pulmonary embolism, you know, it's, is that a hypercoagulable state? Is it, is it unfortunate? It's not serendipity. What's the uh, unfortunate happenstance, I suppose? The opposite, whatever the opposite of serendipity is, like a whole thing. thing. It's yeah. a bad thing. <laughs> Ron, what do you think? Yeah, I can, uh, I mean, she's 93 years old. I would assume she has other, or maybe she has other issues. It sounds like she's negative for COVID twice, but she had pulmonary uh, embolism. I would say that uh, the pulmonary embolism may be related to her other comorbidities because she tested negative. I and mean, certainly we know that patients who get COVID have a period of hypercoagulable, certainly in the hospital and even you know for a couple of months or maybe even more beyond. So you know they're treated uh, as a routine uh, with anticoagulation therapy, blood thinner therapy, during hospitalization, even for a period of time after, for patients who had COVID, just like we do that for patients who get hospitalized for heart failure, pneumonia, uh, other issues, as long as they're not at high risk for bleeding, uh, we tend to do that because there is a period after hospitalization, after acute illness, including COVID, and especially COVID, uh, where you're hypercoagulable or your blood gets uh, thick for a period of time, and you're susceptible, prone to blood clots either in your leg, 
can go to your lung or elsewhere. So, but if she was COVID negative twice, I would say, you know, maybe the pulmonary embolism was related to her other comorbidities, sedentary lifestyle, maybe she has heart failure, or obesity. I don't know what other factors uh, may be uh, involved there. May I chime in? Sure. Yeah, it's cardiopulmonary, right? <laughs> <laughs> this one is what right, walks, crosswalks both of them. So when I was discharged, I, there was a serum marker, um, biomarker in my bloodstream called the serum ferritin level. A normal is about 150. Mine was 22,000. When I, uh, part of the cytokine storm, when I was discharged, it was still elevated. And I knew I was still going through some of that because um, I would eat, even though I didn't taste much, and that has returned, thank goodness, um, I would eat like crazy, but not put on any weight. And that lasted about three or four weeks. And it was a lot of fun. Um, and um, the day I got on the scale, and it, I noticed weight gain appropriate to all the ridiculous food I'd eaten the day before, I knew the cytokine storm was over. My, there's a thing called tumor necrosis factor. It really helps losing weight, but never mind. So I knew the cytokine storm had lasted well beyond feeling I was improving. So maybe a take home for this thing is that the COVID realities fade in different ways and different people, different comorbidities, as Ron was saying. And yes, something like hypercoagulability might be a problem as a downstream issue when you think someone's healing, when in fact they still are hypercoagulable. So maybe that's a con contribution to the question of is pulmonary embolism related? But if it was three to six months later, it would be unlikely. If it was three to six weeks later, it might actually be relevant. So I wonder, I know Marina asked you if you were on blood thinners in your hospital stay in your acute phase. What do you think about aspirin or baby aspirin um, and this might be our last question because we're coming up on the hour. So I'm going to ask both of you for general cardiac health, Ron, and for post-COVID uh, clotting issues. Jonathan, can you talk to us a bit about baby aspirin? And you got 30 seconds each. Go ahead, Ron. I say, you know, baby aspirin is good to prevent arterial issues uh, in patients who uh, have vascular disease uh, on the arterial side. It has not been shown to be helpful on the venous end the venous thromboembolic events. And for short-term use, we do use uh, anticoagulation. We have oral, easy to use oral agents now. Uh, but aspirin doesn't do much on the venous end for, for that. And in terms of healing post-COVID, we don't follow biomarkers as a routine. It's not part of our culture. So it's challenging to say that we have got wrapped our arms around that correctly, except to say that when you're discharged, you become tremendously deconditioned and exercise really also works against this concern of clotting. But specific to COVID, that data is pending. We don't have an answer. I want to bring up one thing, um, and that was just recently, this past week in the news, because of the quarantine and the pandemic, and this is something that affects heart and lung, uh, maybe more lung in the beginning, but uh, is that, that, we, that there was a study that showed that high schoolers, and likely because they were stuck at home with their parents, yay parents, <laughs> are vaping less. So, and, and, you know, the other thing that we had uh, noted that is that Juul, the company that makes the vaping um, actually took a major hit because people were so worried about lung disease during COVID and during the pandemic that they actually were not vaping as much. Do you guys have any final thoughts on that? Good. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yay. Okay. Okay. So no. one, of our, one of our viewers is Megan Burnett, who's watching. She's a college student. And I'm so grateful that people are watching not only from all over the world, but uh, all age groups, because I think that these are messages that as we get them out to all the age groups, this really helps them understand themselves and be able to help their communities stay healthier. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank both of you guys for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to have you. We've both learned so much. And, and you know, just that both of you carried great perspective and care to your patients, which is why, you know, we invited you on the show. And Jonathan, just that, you know, that sort of that thing that you talked about, peace. Well, peace when you were a, a pulse ox of 80 was actually hypoxic euphoria but it was still, <laughs> it still carried you it still carried you past that right to to a point of you know we have to do more and that's the message that we got from both of you so i want to thank you both for joining us today thank you 
My pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And those and who I'm going to buy, a, I'm going to buy a medicine ball uh, immediately. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. Stay on for just a second. We're going to thank our production team. Um, we really love them. They really make us look and sound so good. So thank you all to our production team for making this work every week. Uh, next week, we are going to talk with um, a top urogynecological surgeon, also from Lenox Hill, and a top vascular surgeon uh, from uh, the University of Wisconsin. So Dr. Sue Kwan and Dr. Girma Tefera, they not only excel in their specialties, but in fact, they are absolute global ambassadors and have done humanitarian outreach around the world. So we'll be talking with them about that. Dr. Tefera really leads the American College of Surgeons uh, humanitarian outreach wing, which is called Operation Give Back. And I don't know if you guys know, but Marina Korean is the president of the New York State Society chapter of the American College of Surgeons. So um, we're really happy to feature them next week. Thank you all for watching and for commenting uh, and for really keeping the discussion lively and informative. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank see you. Ya. Bye. Thank you.